touch me any more. Just don't touch me. You better take your hands off your dad now. So... Get in there. Get in. Yeah? I've been to doctors <sighs> and about, well, 15 minutes ago we gave him two diazepam and he gave me some diazepam to give him and they've given him his melatonin. Do you know why you're angry sometimes? Or does it just, it just sort of builds up? Yeah. And does that happen when you've taken the pills as well? Yeah, and I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. Would you be happier if you could find a way not to take the medication? Yeah. What difference would that make to you, do you think? No. The family. What, the family could be better if you weren't taking the medication? Yeah. Yeah, how would that and be? And I stayed out of trouble. When I first met Craig, Ritalin was considered a more effective treatment than behavioural therapy. The evidence for this came from an American research project that compared the two. Called the MTA study, it looked at 600 children over a year and was carried out by some of the world's top experts on ADHD. We did the best study that's ever been done on planet Earth, helping parents and teachers with these children. And what did it show? It showed that the medicine was still a great deal more effective for these children. The MTA study was clear. For children like Craig, drugs worked better than therapy. The findings shaped the way doctors worldwide treated ADHD. It was a big study, and because its initial findings were that medication was as good as, if not superior to, any combination treatment, I think people have relied more on medication as a result of it and ignored psychological treatment. Since the MTA conclusions were published, prescriptions for ADHD drugs have more than tripled in Britain. The Department of Health doesn't know how many of our children are on these drugs, but we've discovered nearly 55,000 were prescribed them by their GPs last year alone. The cost to the NHS was £28 million. But are they actually helpful in the long term? Seven years on, I've come back to the US where the experts have continued to monitor the 600 children in the MTA study. They've looked at what happened to the children who stayed on drugs for three full years. And the results have come as a surprise, even to them. The children had a substantial decrease in their rate of growth. So they weren't growing as much as other kids, both in terms of their height and in terms of their weight. And the second was that there were no beneficial effects. None. I think that we exaggerated the beneficial impact of medication in the first study. We thought that children medicated longer would have better outcomes. That didn't happen to be the case. Until now, parents concerned about putting their children on medication have been reassured that the benefits far outweigh any risks. These new findings call that advice into question. There's no indication that medication is better than nothing in the long run. In the short run, it will help the child behave better. In the long run, it won't. And that information should be made very clear to parents. We've got a generation of children who've been on these kind of pills now for some time, what is the evidence that it's helped them? There's no evidence that it's helped them. As simple as that? It's as simple as that. Some children of the Ritalin generation have worked this out for themselves. Back in the UK, on the edge of the Lincolnshire Wolds, Yash Shah enjoys her Saturday job just like any other 16-year-old. She's been off medication for six months now and has never been happier. But things were quite different a year ago. What's happening here? Um, well, I was watching Coronation Street and I just laughed 
went into the kitchen, went to get a knife, just turned nasty. Went for the knife. Yeah. Um, I've got my mum's ex six foot three boyfriend on my legs. It's then I got a wild animal there. What was happening? I had a lot of tension in my jaw and I asked, screamed for a tea towel. So she put a tea towel in my mouth. But, but why were you in such a rage? What was going on in your head? I can't describe it. It's anger and upset from nothing. I was watching telly. That was it. Well, and this was only a year or so ago. Yeah. Do you recognise that, Yaz? No, not at all. You just look like a different person. Yaz was first diagnosed with ADHD aged four and put on Ritalin. She's had a difficult relationship with her mum growing up and her dad left home when she was still a baby. I think it damaged me, him not being there constantly when I fell out with mum or when she was with her boyfriends or something. Yeah, I think I needed that. And what age were you when your behaviour started to get really bad? 14, 13, my teen years. I was a rebel, I think, you know, I was... <laughs> and that... Bad Yaz. And what, what sort of things would Bad Yaz do? Bad Yaz would steal, fight, bully, self-harm, take do drugs, <laughs> smoke the lot, you know? Mm. Bad Yaz was eventually assigned her own full-time teaching assistant, who could immediately spot in class whether she had taken her medication. It made her concentrate better and keep her in her seat, but um, it actually zombified her. She hadn't had a tablet, you know, bouncing about the class, chatting, shouting out. So, yeah, I saw a complete difference. Oh, it was nice because she was quiet, but <laughs> it wasn't nice because it wasn't Yaz. What did it feel like when you were on the medication? Trapped. Trapped. Fake. Not me. Rubbish. It didn't make me feel good, because it wasn't me. Everything I did well in, I felt ashamed in because I felt like I hadn't succeeded in it. It was the medication. So I wanted to prove a point. And last year she did, but only after she'd reached rock bottom. Suicidal after the sudden death of her brother, Yaz voluntarily went to a psychiatric unit for three months. There she met Dr Sammy Tamimi. I think we bond I bonded with you quite well from the start. That's why I trusted you and that's why I spoke to you, mm. opened up to you, because otherwise you know, there's, it could take weeks for me to trust somebody. Yeah, I think you have a real capacity to look back over all sorts of things that have happened in your life. Yeah. And, and I, I think you've got some pretty sophisticated ideas about what it is that helps you. Yaz says she felt secure enough in the unit to finally come off the pills. Dr Tamimi helped her. Were you surprised to have a, a psychiatrist who was, who was saying, you can do this without the medication? Yeah. yeah. I didn't think it was possible, because otherwise I would have done that a long time ago. Definitely. Have any of the psychiatrists or paediatricians in the past tried to help you do it without medication? They've always tried to help me, but no, I've, they've always thought it's best to stick to medication. That's because for years it's been considered best practice. So Dr Tamimi, who prescribes drugs only as a last resort, has been accused by colleagues of denying children essential treatment. It almost felt like there's some mythical quota that if I wasn't fulfilling this quota, I wasn't doing my job properly. Um, I kind of wonder what the hell did kids used to do? What the hell did families used to do before these mass use of drugs was all around? I mean, do we have any evidence to say that since we've started using these drugs, that our children are better behaved, that our society is happier? Exactly the opposite. Almost a decade on, medication doesn't seem to have made life any happier for Craig Buxton. Like Yaz, he too had a tough time as a baby. His dad left even before he was born, and he spent some time in foster care. Would it be fair to say then that, that you had difficulty bonding with him when he was first born? Yeah, I did. I found it really hard to bond with him because I was so depressed and I had such a bad time carrying him and the pregnancy was a bad pregnancy and I had no support. 
When Craig was five, Sharon met Alan, who's been a supportive father figure for Craig ever since. Things began to look hopeful for the whole family a year later, when Craig got a place at a primary school for boys with emotional and behavioural problems. <laughs> He stayed over two nights a week, giving his parents a regular break and Craig some self-confidence. They were brilliant. They did therapy work with him. They did work to encourage his confidence, tried to teach him how to read other people's emotions and reactions, gave him little bits of responsibility. The involvement with the parents as well, with the school is excellent. They involve you in everything. Don't exclude you from nothing. It was a brilliant school. With their support, Craig even came off medication for a while, but it wasn't to last. The transfer to secondary school has been disastrous and his behaviour has gone rapidly downhill. Everything's been undone, absolutely everything. It was, it's, it, you know, it's, it's sad because in a way it's been a complete, not a waste of time, Craig, doing that schooling. He's learnt, since he left that school, he's learned absolutely nothing. Things couldn't be much worse now. After assaulting his teachers, Craig's out of school altogether. Medication is all that's on offer to him. Earlier this year, he was put on yet another powerful drug, an antipsychotic normally prescribed to adult schizophrenics. Craig was given it to calm his impulsive behaviour. It didn't work. I've got, I've got a scar down there, or oh, I've got it all the way to about there. Uh, cut loads under there, I've done one across there. And I've done the most on this arm. But they're all gone now because I've got hairy arms. It was self-harming, threatening suicide, depression very bad. Saying he was hearing voices in his head. His night terrors were terrible. Antipsychotics are known to cause insomnia, diabetes and even brain damage in adults. Again, the Department of Health doesn't know how many children are on them, but we've discovered around 8,000 were prescribed them by their GPs in 2005, often for behavioural problems. Not good practice, according to the man who writes mental health guidelines for doctors. I think um, a, a generous understanding would be to say that, that, that doctors have reached the point where they don't know what else to offer and they haven't got the right supports to help parents and children in difficult circumstances. Um, but I think perhaps, perhaps even that is no real excuse for the use of drugs which are associated with such severe side effects. Craig's off the antipsychotic now, but his violent night terrors have continued. He's suffering. He wakes up some mornings and he's still sobbing. It's really bad for him. You went walkabouts last night again. I didn't. Yes, you did. How did I? Because you were swearing and threatening to kill somebody and stab him in the eye. And you went downstairs again and come back up. I can remember that. I said, and you was having no, my... No, there was this little lad on me bandit right. I goes, I'm going to stab him in the eye. <laughs> When you first agreed to give him medication when he was just four years old, could, did you ever imagine that you'd, you'd be here now in this situation? Oh, no, in a million years. I, you know, I thought, well, by the time he hits high school, maybe 12, 13, you know, we'll have, we'll have the real Craig. To be in a worse situation than what we were then, you know, it's, it's crippling for us. Do you think you've you've done all you could? Well, yeah, but I think, you know, maybe... I'm not saying we're perfect, and I'm not saying that, you know, we have done everything. There's probably things we have missed, but that's where the experts come in. That, you know, that that's where we, we are asking their advice. We want their advice. We want them to tell us where we're going wrong, if we have gone wrong, and to help us to put things right and do things differently. So you're truly open to that as a parent? I take any criticism from anywhere and any help from anywhere. Over in upstate New York, Professor Pelham runs intensive ADHD summer camps to help not just the children, but their parents and teachers too. 
By targeting families with a support package as soon as a diagnosis is made, he believes all but the most troubled children can be helped without the need for drugs. We're teaching the kids two things, better skills and also uh, better cooperativeness and team sportsmanship for how to, how to better get along with children while they're doing a football or a soccer activity. While the children are put through their paces outside, inside, their parents are taught how they can help. So let's say I go into the school and I have this interaction with my child's teacher. What's going to be some of the short-term impact of that? We actually teach parents good parenting skills. We teach them what to do if their child misbehaves, how to respond appropriately to the child's misbehavior that will help the child learn to behave better in the future. They come to 10 weeks of classes where we teach these skills to them. We go out to schools to teach teachers how to establish interventions in the classroom that can benefit children with ADHD, like daily report cards. And there's good evidence that all of these approaches actually make a difference. There's very good evidence that all of these approaches work. What do you think your son benefits from? I think he benefits a lot from us having a consistent schedule at home and then working it into the school with his daily report card and the constant feedback and the monitoring. He really has improved and has turned around 180%. Any child and adolescent mental health service could do this. It's very easy to do. It's not rocket science. It's good common sense. Families here, though, complain they often don't have access to therapy or parenting programmes. Dr Kendall is heading a team for the National Institute for Clinical Excellence that's considering what treatment should be available. They're writing new guidelines based on all the latest research, including the new MTA findings. I hope that we will be able to make recommendations that will give people, based on the best evidence we've got, a, 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 a comprehensive approach to treatment that will advise about the use of parent training programmes, the use of, of behavioural interventions of other kinds, that will advise uh, about what teachers might be able to do within the classroom when they're trying to deal with kids that, that have difficult problems of this kind. I think the important thing is that, that, that we have a comprehensive approach which doesn't focus just on one type of treatment. But, but what if psychological treatments just aren't available? If we were talking about cancer, no one would accept an answer which said, well, there aren't many treatments available, so what do we do? Um, the right answer is we need to make these things available for the children that need it, whether it's cancer or it's hyperactivity or it's childhood depression or whatever. This time last year, Yaz was just scraping by at school. Ditching the pills six months ago was a bold move, but she wanted to see if she could manage her behaviour herself. Apart from a tablet on exam day to help her focus, she's been drug-free ever since. The result? She passed all eight GCSEs and even got two A's. I'm amazed I've come through it, to be honest. But I'm so happy. So happy. It, I could have gone so the wrong way and ended up a mess. But I think it's quite an achievement that I've, I've managed to do it. What next for Craig, though? When I met him seven years ago, medication was supposed to help his behaviour. But just as the latest scientific research has found, it's made little difference long term. Where's the call? In court, Craig pled guilty to assault and was put on a supervision order. Do you understand what happened? Mm. Come tell us what tell you think what happened you, then. Tell me what you think happened. What are you being charged with? If Craig is to avoid ending up in jail, his family hope he'll now finally be offered more than just medication. One day, Craig's going to get himself into a lot of trouble and then we won't be able to help him. I just hope that day doesn't come, but I can see it's well on its way. As he's getting older now, he's getting much stronger and who knows what he's going to do. I'm happy when I'm not angry. I ha I'm happy when I don't swear. I'm happy when I see my parents and I'm happy 
when they're happy. Craig Buxton ending that report by Shelley Joffrey. And if you are the parent of an ADHD child, please don't take any drastic action without consulting your doctor first. For more information on the condition, there will be a special helpline number on the screen in just a moment. Next week, Madeleine McCann. Richard Bilton, who's followed the case for the BBC since the start, goes in search of the truth in a Panorama special. If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's panorama and would like to talk to someone in confidence for further information and support, please call the BBC Action Line free on 0800 077 077. Lines are open seven days a week from 7.30am until midnight. Unscripted. Unreserved. There's no point in me denying it. I happen to have religious conviction. Unconstrained. I'm not hiding the fact that there were disagreements. Unexpected. You know, after a time you sort of cease to be regarded as a human being, you just become this, this thing. The real Tony Blair. You just gotta be big enough to kind of give it away. The politics and the key players. Well, I view our relationship as forged in battle. The Blair Years begins Sunday at 10.15. Is that that then? On BBC One. If you've been inspired to study by Open University programmes on the BBC, call 0870 942 1344 for your free magazine or visit open2.net. With signing a great British journey across southern England this morning at 3.25. <laughs> Now, with compelling interviews with close friends and family and never-before-seen footage, BBC One Sign Zone conjures up the flair, character and artistry of an enigmatic superstar.